production begins in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Community Foundation Spotlight here on your local public broadcasting station, PAC-14. My name is Doug Wilson and I am the President and CEO of the Community Foundation and we are very pleased to have with us today as our guest, Lieutenant Colonel Donald Hawkins, Hawkins, Hawkins. U.S. Marine Corps, retired as of November 1st. Hoorah! Thank you for your service and welcome you. to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Appreciate well, it. Well, before we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Donald Hawkins, your background and what you're doing and that kind of well, thing. Well, um, I commissioned in 1983, uh, a age 46 pilot by initial trade, uh, got out in 1990 uh, after flying, you know, successful first tour to go into the civilian community, made a mistake saying, hey, <laughs> sure, I'll join the reserves, yeah, you okay. know. And uh, a few months later, I was a uh, pack on my back. Uh, with Desert Storm. Came back from that, figured out my best day, uh, my worst day riding was still a heck of a lot better than my best day walking. Transferred to tanks as a Ford, you know, a Ford <laughs> Air Controller. Then So you were a pilot? Yeah, I was a pilot. No now I'm a tanker, yeah, <laughs> you know, but still as a Ford Air Controller, controlling air from, yeah, you know. Right. And then uh, got, um, you know, I said, okay, you know, a few years later, I said, okay, I'm done. But this time I figured out to get all the way out. And um, you know, it didn't, that didn't stick. You know, the towers came down. Got a phone call, and you, know, you were was, back in yeah, it. Yeah, back, back in uniform. <laughs> I ended up. Uh, the Marine Corps can move fast if they want something. They, they uh, reinstated my commission, reset my date of ranks for me, and over the telephone, got an airline ticket, and you know, very quickly was spun back up and hit Kuwait and threw my gear on top of the tank about three days before we crossed the line of departure going north. So, you know, came back from that and thought I'd get back out, but it didn't work out and. <laughs> Ended up uh, doing another six and a half years on active duty. My goodness. So for the last couple of years, I've I've been uh, back in the reserves, uh, which gave us opportunity me an opportunity to get involved with this program. But uh, November one was retired, retired. You know, close close the book on that chapter. <laughs> well, no, I'm not. I, I'm not buying that. They're going to call you up for no. something else. <laughs> Please, no. Uh, no, uh, no, you're done. Well, I mean, I guess retired. You know, it's, it's called the retired reserves. You know, yeah. you're still on the list for a number of years, but. It's a and I did actually serve with a, with a, a number of retired officers who come back on active duty. I bet. So, but let's <laughs> let's hope that doesn't go that way. So. Well, good. But anyway, Colonel Hawkins, we're here to talk about today about your veteran support group, Camp Royal Oak. Thanks. Yeah. What is Camp Royal well, Oak? Uh, Camp Royal Oak. It's it's a transition facility for yeah. for veterans that are they're homeless, um, basically in a, in a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. The organization it, it's it's a it's a nonprofit organization that that manages Camp Royal Oak and has some other projects brewing. But Camp Royal Oak is the main facility, and that organization, the five hundred one c three organization, is called Veteran Support Centers of America, mm -hmm. and um, it's uh, it's located uh, in uh, in Quantico, Maryland. It's outside of Salisbury. Mm -hmm. It is uh, uh, sits on fifty acres. There's a couple of facilities out there. One main house uh, is provisions for 20 uh, homeless male. Mm -hmm. And then we have a second house that we have reprovisioned re a number of times to, to handle female, mm -hmm. uh, female with children, uh, male children. So it, it kind of is a, it's, it's a utility house that, uh, that helps us kind of meet, uh, meet needs. It don't come up that often, fortunately, but we're able to adjust for that. How did how did it really get started? I mean, it, well, I didn't. Yeah, what was the genesis of it? Uh, well, we were really fortunate to have a gentleman in our community who was working downtown uh, Salisbury. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a shower and a kitchen in his office, mm -hmm. and uh, he was opening his heart and his his uh, office to to some of the homeless downtown for to shower up and and get some get some food. And, and he ended up working with a with a younger man who. Um, that had, you know, he was kind of a shell of himself. He was homeless, and then over time, it turned out, you know, he he learned that this was a veteran, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Iraq War veteran, uh, who had led men in combat, and uh, but he was, you know, violent mood swings. He was having a lot of problems, mm -hmm. uh, to the point uh, that he got him up to um, to Baltimore uh, for help, mm -hmm. and he received a phone call uh, months later. Okay, and I lost track. Months later, uh, Dice, we told that, hey, look, uh, we found the note that you put in the guy's pocket when you sent him up here. But uh, uh, the good news is we have him and he's getting help. The bad news is that he has traumatic brain injury. 
and uh, oh is not going to survive, and he ended up dying from this. It was a time where traumatic brain injury was still kind of an emerging realization, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a signature in injury, yeah. and he had been, you know, hit enough times um, oh. that, that he had, you know, that had caused that damage. That, that man's name, uh, his man's name was Jerry Black. Jerry then set off on a mission to start, you know, he started looking at, hey, we got more of these veterans here. Um, and it kind of was an awakening for him. Mm -hmm. And he committed himself to uh, providing, uh, a, you know, a way to care for, for these veterans coming back to our communities, our right. sons and daughters, you know. And uh, he ran into a lot, it was a lot of, it was a lot of, it was an uphill battle uh, for mm -hmm. him. Jerry's not a veteran, so there was a lot of, you know, a lot of issues right from the very beginning there. Mm -hmm. But he persevered basically through through away his own livelihood doing it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, started down a process, you know, the dealing, you know, on the government side of things. You know, when he first started out, the official the official count for homelessness on the eastern shore of Maryland for veterans was three. We had three. Three. Yeah, but understand that's just because of the way the numbers and the census and the, and the mechanics of, of, of that Counting. process works. Yeah. Everybody logically knew we had far more than that. Uh, but then he started the process where you have to do, you know, something called a stand down, where there's numbers and there's a census taken, and he started these stand downs where all veterans were allowed to come and start getting services. But then those veterans that were in crisis would identify themselves. They they did identify themselves, and from that they started building numbers. Well, once the numbers could support it, then VA let a small contract to help support those veterans that were in the facility that he was providing. Right, and it kind of grew from there. Wow. And um, then it eventually moved out to Camp Royal Oak. It, it's it's really uh, you know, that's that's how it's that's how it's began and that's how it's, wow. it's moved forward. So you're taking care of, of people who have traumatic well brain injuries, or no, you're referring no. them. The way it's veterans, okay, yeah. veterans in crisis, okay. Right. I mean, it's, it's a it's I don't like to use the word homeless, but you know, I guess some you know it is a homeless. It's a transition. So veterans that are trans, you know, who who. Uh, get in for that situation for lots of reasons. I mean, nobody just wakes up in the morning and says, hey, I'm going to try this new lifestyle out called homelessness. Right, right. It doesn't work that way. I mean, right. there's there's typically a crisis that's going on. Right. It could be a combat-related crisis that's mm -hmm. come back home. It could be a domestic crisis. It could be an economy. It could be a heart attack, you know, mm -hmm. living paycheck to paycheck, one heart attack away from being unemployed, and suddenly you're homeless. Right. So all kinds of uh, all kinds of reasons are, are why veterans come to yeah you know come to Camp Royal. Oak. Can you tell us how many you have out there and kind of what the well, demographics of them? Sure. The there are currently uh, 15. Uh, the facility can can go to 20 for mail. Um, and then again, I, I explained we can reconfigure the other facility, mm -hmm. and we work with other service providers for the female and female with children uh, to, to address those unique needs. Mm -hmm. So there's there's 15 out there now. Uh, since the since the program has begun, uh, there's been a total of uh, I get the last count it was 175 that you've seen that that have that have Gone. come and, and been, been resident been guests. The, mm -hmm. the, the term is guest. Okay. So they have been guests at, at uh, Camp Royal Oak. Okay. And of that, 97% uh, have successfully transitioned uh, back. Uh, wow. Now, understand the measurement of effectiveness here. The measurement of success is, is when they leave Camp Royal Oak, there's a roof over their head, food in their stomach, and they are completely plugged into the VA system, be it healthcare, mental health, or whatever right. support services. So they are now plugged into that. And a lot of people just don't, don't engage with the VA uh, right. You know, mm -hmm. and we we facilitate that, and then they're engaged with other uh, private uh, service providers, not right. necessarily the government, okay. that uh, that support them. So, can you tell us a little bit more about the women and the, the children? Well, and the women and children. I mean, this is a this is a unique and this is a very special uh, area. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's it's not a one size. I mean, the the the, the male veteran. It's pretty much a Mark One, Mod Zero, male you right. know, serviceman veteran. Exactly. Uh, and when you move into the it, dealing with women, it's it's a whole other set of uh, of issues. Children are involved. Other other um, aspects of their service uh, traumas mm -hmm. that may have taken place right. become involved. And it really is a community effort to to help deal with with these. And and, and oftentimes there's an extended family that's involved, uh, and then mm -hmm. with the children. Yeah. So other other organizations. Uh, we partnered with an organization called Maple Shade. Oh yes, very familiar. For with them. for uh, supporting the children, right? Uh, great work. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's a it's a team effort. 
uh, every each time we've had a female um, uh, supporting a female, we have uh, had to reconfigure. I mean, it, it's a case by case issue. Right. Um, so, and, but, and I should also say, there's other organizations that support the females as well. Uh, Home of the Brave out of Delaware mm -hmm. is just now opening up a new female facility. Okay. So that will probably relieve us of some of the female work to mm -hmm. reconfigure maybe to veterans with pets, you know, the service animal. Right. So right. there's, you know, we have to be, we have to, you can't just think square peg, square hole, right. round peg, square hole. You have to be able to think, you know, outside that full demand because people are living lives and, and, and you know, right. so meet them where they are to help. Good. So. Do women tend, is their success rate as, Good as the men's? Or? Uh, yes, um, okay. I, yeah, I, I would say so. But again, it's a totally it, 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 there are totally different sets of uh, challenges. Right. So. All right. When you say when you leave, you're you're saying ninety seven percent success rate, food in their belly, roof over their head, yeah. and they're plugged into the and, veterans. And, and, that, and that could be now. That, that's a wide range too. That right. could be they've moved uh, through uh, into an apartment. Right. Okay. Uh, it could be they've moved to Perry Point for further on, you know, medical support. Right. Uh, and you know, it's we have a wide range. I mean, you, you look at life; we have a wide range. And, and we've we've also been fortunate uh, enough to have been able to be there to provide end of life. Um, oh dear. You know, support yeah. uh, for for veterans who's without families that basically, or who, or in one case, one who actually just said, "I want to be amongst, you know, my brothers." Right. Okay. Um, which plays a huge role in, in, the, oh, sure. in the success rate. You know, when we when we talk about a success rate like that, I mean, the we keep the numbers, but you have to keep in perspective everything that goes into that success rate. Mm -hmm. um, we're a facility that uh, provides a safe, safe, safe roof over the head, um, and food in the you know food in the stomach. And transportation. We're, we we spend a lot of time transporting. We're a big transportation company. Yeah. <laughs> and but we'll we'll take veterans to services such as the Cambridge Clinic, uh, Pocomo mm -hmm. Clinic, mm -hmm. um, um, to appointments to work. Just a wide range of transportation. Um, mm -hmm. So you you have to, these these organizations such as the VA clinics. I mean they're 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 just doing amazing work. Uh, the VA mm -hmm. is very committed. Uh, to to the homeless, you know, to supporting homeless veterans, and yeah. you know, you know, terms ending homelessness. I mean, that would be that'd be great. I mean, yes. we we're, we're, we'd love to work ourselves out of a job. I mean, that's actually the mission is to work yourself out of a job. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe someday we can actually do that. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, uh, we're very fortunate to have very very dedicated people in the VA uh, who work very hard uh, to support support veterans. It's a challenging mission. I bet it so, is. Yeah, they do good work. So you take the VA. Uh, you take private providers, um, so you know there's you, you get the government support. Maryland, mm -hmm. MDVA, Maryland Department of Veterans Administration has a piece in their support, uh, and then you have a number of private providers who are providing things to, to veterans from job support, retraining support, right. uh, doors, um, Department of Rehabilitation Services, Lower mm -hmm. Shore Enterprises mm -hmm. uh, is who's a provider to to doors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's for job retraining. A lot of times we'll bring a veteran in and. Right. You know, job. So, when we look at that success rate, you have to look at the big picture. Okay, there's a lot mm -hmm. of people who are rowing yes. in the who are rowing right. the same direction to, right. to to come up with that success rate. Yeah. How long do they stay? It's uh, typically right now. It's it's about a three to four month stay. Three to four yeah. months. Yeah. I mean, okay. uh, a lot of times the first month is just get stable. Uh, you know, get in. You know, come come inside the wire, so to speak. Yes, uh, and you're with your brothers. Yes, right. okay. huge. That has a huge uh, um, right. impact on success. Right, I should say. Um, so get in, get stable, um, get into the routine, get mm -hmm. plugged into the VA systems. That does that doesn't happen just immediately. It takes time. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, it may be you know the medical appointments, get right medications uh, going, right. Uh, let those take effect. Uh, and then you know transition you know get into uh, doors or you, you work with lower shore enterprises or get into the job, and then help transition back. Right. The demographics on that have a huge impact as well. Um, initially, when we started, we were looking at one third, one I call it one third, one third, one third, one third Vietnam, one third Gulf War, and one third Iraq Afghanistan. Um, the depending upon you know what what the crisis was maybe it had been a long term homelessness situation in right. a lot, in a lot of the cases with the Vietnam veterans that was a longer stay uh, and then maybe more time at Perry Point 
to get to get back into to get transitioned out of that. Right. You're talking mm -hmm. a lot of years mm -hmm. uh, in some cases. The Gulf War veteran uh, was more of a there was that state didn't last very long. Mm -hmm. They'd hit the ground, and that was more of a wake up in the morning and my God, I'm homeless. I lost my job or um, whatever. And it's like it never in a million years did they think that was going to happen. And now they're in this life crisis. So we provide a stable environment. They'd hit Warwick, get re, you know CDL license or get some training. Boom, they're back out into the job market. And then the emerging, when we started, with the emerging was the Iraq Afghanistan. And they were presenting with more, uh, uh, more uh, struggles right. as a result of service. Right. Uh, the demographics have shifted now. There's less Vietnam, uh, less mm -hmm. Gulf, and now, of course, more Iraq, Afghanistan. Right. And that makes sense because we're not making any more Vietnam veterans. We're not making any Gulf War veterans. We're still making Iraq, Afghanistan veterans. Right. Right. And, they're, and they're coming home and you know, walking into an employment situation that's pretty rough. It is. It, yeah. yeah, so... Okay. so. Well, we're going to take a pause here for just a second and welcome any viewers who may have joined us later. Uh, my name is Doug Wilson, and I'm the president and CEO of the Community Foundation of the Eastern Shore. And I have Lieutenant Colonel Don Hawkins with us today. Uh, we're talking about his organization called What Camp Royal, and learning more about the the I don't know what you really call it, but the the, the fortunes or misfortunes of the veterans, some veterans who return home with specific needs. And uh, we're very very happy to have you with us today. Pleasure so to be here. Um, let's talk about medical care for. Sure. These folks. What can you tell us about that? And and uh, I guess there's homelessness, which is a big thing you want to work on. Right. And then these people who are homeless probably also have other issues, sure. right? Well, you know, living in the woods or, or living in a homeless environment uh, that doesn't it isn't very conducive to being able to obtain adequate medical care and right. consistent medical care. Uh, as veterans uh, in this situation, we're very fortunate that. Uh, we live in a country where we do have uh, a Veterans Administration with medical care right. uh, provided. And we're very fortunate in this particular area to have, uh, we have a clinic in Cambridge mm -hmm. and we have a clinic in, in Pocomoke, VA clinics in, mm -hmm. in, in Cambridge and Pocomoke that can provide a level of support. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, with follow-on capabilities in, in Baltimore or up in Perry Point. Okay. So uh, medical care is, I would say good you know it, it, it's this is not the well, horror stories you know coming out of you know previous war you know Vietnam sure. era and things like that and I would say this is not the VA of our of my father uh, you know it uh -huh. is this is I've really um, you know I've really seen some great things things happen yeah um, some people really get some 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 help uh, that they they really need and whole personalities turn around yeah and and, and real human beings emerge come right. come back right uh, so that's wonderful I mean you know the stories there's lots of you know from from literally having to talk somebody down off the top of a refrigerator you know in the middle of the night consistently just you know those type of panic attacks to you know honor student yeah. You know, right. it just yeah. that that kind of and and that doesn't happen without the without the the VA medical. How big of, how big of an area do you serve? Well, we serve the Del, I'd say we serve the Delmarva. Okay, um, so that would include Delaware. We have a number of Delaware veterans that come. Okay, uh, down and we have also you know there's you know, the home of the brave in Delaware. We've we've also moved a veteran from our which is more long term two year program. We've moved veterans from our facility up there. Veterans really don't have boundaries. I mean, the state lines don't really, you know, veterans don't They're have meaningless. that so much. Right. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll serve from a lot of areas. Obviously, being being here, uh, uh, Wicomico, uh, the, the tri-county area here, that's pr that's predominantly where our, our veterans come from. Okay. And the other thing will happen is we'll have a veteran who may leave here, go to Perry Point, and then come back to Camp Royal Oak to then transition back into, into the community. Excuse me, drop sure. stuff here. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. yeah, it's it's. Yeah. Do you? I, it seems to me like um, that finding jobs for vets is really paramount to them too. It mm -hmm. seems to me a lot of them want to work and oh, want absolutely. to be get backed into mainstream. It's an interesting uh, dynamic. I mean, so let's say you take uh, a young man or young woman out of high school, and they go and they serve their country. They're gone three, six years. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, in that time, they have been challenged. They have led, 
you know, service members, they have had immense responsibility, mm-hmm. um, and they come back to the community. Yeah. You know, you know, and when they come back, they find that those jobs, you know, the, the only thing that's been is an entry-level job. Those supervisor jobs, people have already mm-hmm. came out, they had those jobs, they've worked their way up within the company, now they're the, you know, they can come in, hey, you know, you've been in charge of the motor pool, you've been coordinating convoys, you've been, you know, mm-hmm. planning convoys, but, you know, we have a job here where you can change tires. You know, it's very difficult. It's, it's very difficult. Uh, yes. And then it's very hard to, to there are issues in just re- relating, you know, uh, decompressing from those, right. from those situations. So the, it's not just have a job. It's a job that is, you know, right. is, is got the, Commensurate with your abilities and, and, and your education. Like anybody, right. like any human right. being would, would, be, would be looking for. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, compound that these are tough times. Well, they are tough yeah, times. And so everybody, you know, you, you just have to compound the situation. But, um, you know, helping people, uh, helping people understand or be able to translate the skill mm-hmm. sets that a military member has into the civilian. Mm-hmm. And, right. you know, typically once, once they're employed, people reap the benefits of that uh, training they've had. They do. And, you know, I think, uh, at least my awareness has been heightened, I think that Hiring veterans is becoming a nationwide phenomenon. I mean, businesses and major corporations are yeah. are expending right. resources to try and assist, and, and they're advertising. Right. You know, well, you know, I look at that for two from two perspectives. One, it's a very it's a very uh, noteworthy, you know, and it's the right thing to do. So businesses want to be involved with doing the right thing. Right. But there is also a positive return on the investment. There are businesses at the end of the day. Right. They have to operate, and they're getting a great return on their investment when they get when they hire a veteran. Right. Because the taxpayers have spent lots of money instilling that discipline and those the, those organizational skills and time management skills and you know right. commitment and loyalty into these individuals, and then the business gets to benefit from that. Right. So it's a two-way street. The businesses get something out of it as well. I know they do, but I'm glad they're doing it. Yeah, I, I mean, the, sure. the awareness now is much better. Absolutely. Where do you get your funding from? Well, that, that's a, that's a uh, funding comes from a lot, of, a lot of sources. Okay. And I think what we need to understand as a community, this, is, this, is a, this is to me would be like the most important thing to understand, is we cannot depend upon the government to take care of our sons and daughters, okay? We're a community, this is our responsibility. The government does a great job and they provide, you know, the uh, Camp Royal has a contract with the, with the VA um, to, to for, you know, for every veteran that's in there, there's, there's funding mm-hmm. that is provided. But you know, it's, those, that's based upon uh, the actual, that, that covers the actual cost of supporting that particular, that veteran. It doesn't necessarily support all the infrastructure costs Oh, transportation no. costs. I mean, it's there's a lot that goes into that, and that's right. a pri- that's the private sector that comes in our community that comes to make that happen. Okay. Um, you know, community foundation has been very key in helping bring us together with people mm-hmm. uh, who have been able to provide support, uh, corporations, individuals, uh, some from the veteran service organizations, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know that all comes together. It has to be. It has to be a public-private team. Yeah. You know, that it, there's, we can't do it otherwise. And to right. think that to think we can do it otherwise is right. Is is, it, is there anything that you need specifically? I mean, we have a pretty yeah. good viewing audience out right. here. What do you need right now? Uh, right now, yeah. like I said, one of our biggest factors is transportation. It's it's great that we're out there in Quantico. It's a, it's a ways away. It's quiet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it allows. It's a good environment for for uh, for decompressing. Right. Uh, and working as a team of veterans out there, but it's a ways out there. We basically have driven the wheels off of two of our vehicles. So we are in need of, uh, uh, transport- of, of vehicles. Uh, we're in need of, you know, you, you see some- Van types? Van, one, a, a passenger van, right. um, and the, what we need, what we really need is a, is a diesel, uh, you see the, uh, the lower shore, uh, or the yeah. transportation yes. vehicles, that c- it's a, a mini bus, a kind mini of bus. It's yeah. like something like you take from the airport over to the rental car. You know, right, not, right, not the great you. big buses. One that has a a, a wheelchair lift okay. on, on it. So those are the two things that are really really uh, focused on right now. So, well, so if someone uh, knows of a veteran that needs help or coordination or assistance from your organization, how do they get in touch with you? All right, thanks. This is uh, here's the phone number. 
Uh, the phone, the duty phone at Camp Royal Oak is 410-873-2550. So okay. 410-873-2550. Just ask to uh, speak with the duty supervisor. Okay. Or go to the website at http colon slash slash www.vscoa.org. That's www.vscoa, V-S-C-O-A. Dot org org great okay that's lovely all right if also you know I think we talked a little bit previously about the fact that you need a vehicle mm -hmm. particularly this minibus this right. diesel kind of thing right. that I, I liked your characterization of it's something when you go to the airport and you get yeah. driven to your I was trying to say, how do you explain this thing and well that's you know, that's typically what I uh, yeah. So, if, if you're out there, you have one of these, you have access to one of these, they are in desperate need, get in touch with the colonel. Um, that would be terrific. Uh, otherwise, I'm quite certain that you're willing to take donations of one kind or another. There's, there's a way, way to, to do, do that. There's a way to do that on the website, too, and it works. There you go. <laughs> so, go to their website. They're in desperate need. These are our sons and daughters who have fought for our country, died for our country, and have consequences as a result of their service. And we thank them for it, but we need to help them now. And as you said, it is a community is. debt that we have to pay. It has and, to be a community uh, effort. It has to be a community effort. Anything else you want to leave no, us with? No, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to bring this to the attention. And, and I appreciate people listening and, Great. and responding. Colonel, it's Hoorah. been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Hoorah is right. <laughs> thank you for joining us uh, today on uh, PAC-14 on the Community Foundation Spotlight. And hope to see you uh, again soon tuning in to another program. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Would you like to see your community organization or nonprofit group featured on PAC-14? To get started, contact us at 410-677-5014 or visit our website at www.pac14.org. PAC-14 is a great way to connect with your community.